You're listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience, as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your favorite CCT personality, JTAC extraordinaire, embracer of the ridiculous face, and like the shortest operator you'll ever meet, Peaches. Hey everybody, welcome to the Ones Ready Podcast. You're in the team room. We've got a special guest today. We have Roomba, and he is a TACP with us. I have, uh, I have personally worked with Roomba for a long time, um, so we're excited to have him on the podcast. It, this podcast will hopefully answer a lot of the questions that you guys have had about what are the primary differences between TACP and combat control. So we're looking forward to this. We've been trying to set this up for a while, and we finally got it. So we're excited to have you guys here and tuning in. So Roomba, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Rock on. All right. So moving on to what we actually wanted to talk about with you guys, the difference between TACP and combat control. So Rumba, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what TACP is, what it stands for, some of the primary mission sets that you guys do from a conventional perspective. That way we can, and you know, and then you can go on and I'll, we'll kind of curate a little bit, if you will, just to make sure we hit everything. But like TACP, what drove you to go TACP? Yeah, so um, number one, TACP, Tactical Air Control Party. Uh, one of the biggest things that people miss is we're not a single member. Uh, so normally um, we have an officer and we have an enlisted guy. Um, our officers being um, our 19 Zulu and now uh, TACP enlisted dudes being one Zulu three. Uh, so a two-man team, um, an air liaison officer, and then the TACP, who's normally an enlisted member who carries JTAC responsibilities. Um, the main reason why I decided to be a TAC P uh, was number one, can't swim. Uh, PJs and CCTs are great swimmers, so I'll throw it out there. Uh, I'm Puerto Rican. I'm good at swimming slow, but don't make me swim fast. Don't like it. <laughs> All right. So um, that was one of the things. Uh, to be honest with you, when I came in, um, I came in for cyber. I knew about the three, uh, the three combat peripherals, what I really called, um, and then I knew about. Um, uh, Sal T now, obviously SR, um, but I was, didn't have enough information to make my decision. So I pushed into basic with a count, well, open contract. I went there, took the PT test for CCT and tag P. And then the first thing that the CCT guy said is like, Hey, you ready for this swim? And I was like, got it. Tag P it is. <laughs> so yeah. So, um, I knew about tag P. I'd done some research, um, on the career field, uh, and pretty much all of them, and I knew the TACPs worked with the Army, uh, which kind of intrigued me, and it said that TACPs were one, the only guy in the Air Force representative to an Army unit. Uh, so that kind of made me feel a little bit more comfortable because I figured it was going to be a good job and I was going to be working with the Army. So that was the main reason why I went TACP. Okay, and I mean, obviously, you've been, you've been in for how long now? Uh, I've been in for 13 and a half years now, about to hit 14. Yeah. You're in the double digits now. I know. You got to push all the way through now. So, <laughs> you you wanted to work with the army on purpose? Uh, that- you know what? They tell you that up front. Like initially, it's like I'm so excited, and then after 13 years of being with the army, uh, there's a reason why I'm a Duke Field uh, on the AFSOC side. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's actually pretty funny too. Like we always, you know, there's always the inner service rivalries. There's even rivalries in the career field and stuff, not tribalism. It's just, it's just different. So when people hear us talk about that, they immediately go to like, Oh no, there is, there's, these guys are the worst. I'm, I already tell everybody this, like I'm the oldest of uh, four boys. The other three are in the army. Like I'm the oldest, I'm in the air force. Everybody else is in the army. Yes. We all make fun of each other constantly. Like it's just a thing, but there are differences. Look, what, what are some of those differences when you're, you're like, yeah, man, it's, it's working with the Army. What are, what are some of those differences that you're talking about? Yeah, man. So um, I'll start with like PT. Uh, the Army believes in like huge formations of people uh, where our career field, just like your career feels like they're, they kind of go off to the individual. Uh, so they want to make sure like you're getting taken care of individually. Uh, they have a lot of those programs, but I would argue with the sizes that they have, it's just a little bit harder. Um, additionally, the chain of command is a little bit different, um, in our teams, uh, 
there's definitely a chain of command, but it's a lot easier for you to be able to approach your leadership and voice your opinions and talk about uh, what you want to talk about. I think in the army is a little bit harder because of that structure and everything that they focus on. Um, and I understand it. Um, the army trains a lot of people. Um, I think we're, they're very number specific versus where you go with specialization. So by the time yeah. one of our dudes gets out of training, we're not well, as a- immature. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a lot of why people are, are drawn to special operations on the air force side, because we are so small. The organization is much flatter. When your commander says you have an open door policy, he really means walk into my office at any time and tell me anything you want and we'll hash it out. Like, yeah, I think, I think that's good. And it's not, it's not bad. I'm sure the army has a ton of good things too. I just haven't figured out what those are yet. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Everybody. <laughs> I'm kidding, everybody in the army. Again, I say this in the in the (laughs) same. He is, but he's not. (laughs) Brian's over there, like, oh, you're gonna get counsel after this now. That's it. (laughs) The seventh group chow halls are pretty dope. Yeah, all right. Now we're talking. Everybody, everybody likes food. Everybody needs food. Positive side. There we go. Yeah. Hey, Ruben, you you talked about the chain of command. So, if your air force, the army has their own chain of command. You have your own chain of command. How, do, how does that kind of flesh itself out? Yeah, so uh, operationally or even uh, stateside, it actually mirrors itself. Um, administrative command of like TACP and obviously Air Force members sits with our commander. Uh, so he makes sure that everything admin side is taken care of. Uh, the actual operational employment uh, of TACP is kind of a 50-50. Uh, our commander talks with the Army commander Marine commander, whatever conventional force we're supporting, which we do support the army. And then we've been supporting the Marines recently quite a bit. Um, they talk together about operational employment. And then once we've gotten our guidance and at the tactical level, then we obviously work for a company commander, a battalion commander, a brigade commander, whoever we're working with at that point. But we have our operational instructions uh, by the time we go actually tactically employed. Okay. So how long, like, once you got to your flight, your team, how long before you became a JTAC and you started deploying? Yeah, so um, TAGP, uh, again, unique to us because we come in a few more numbers, I would argue, uh, than the other uh, special warfare career fields. Um, I deployed initially in two, uh, 2006 before I was even JTAC qualified. Um, so I would argue it was a, actually a blessing. My JTAC got uh tack to go support fifth group in iraq um, and i was with him fifth group initially said no way we're not taking a room ad uh, but my jtac said if you don't take the room ad you're not getting the jtac uh, hey just so, just pause right there for people that don't know what a room ad is can you spell that one out yeah for sure so it's a term that we used to use a lot we still use it it's radio operator maintainer and driver um it was pretty much uh a nice way of telling us that we were the backpack mule and the programmer Right. So ju- just like a machine gunner or somebody else on a small team has an assistant gunner, you're the assistant radio dude. Pretty much. That's a really nice way of saying it. I'm going to keep yeah. that. I'm going to keep that. <laughs> assistant radio guy. Not right. what I actually felt like. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, that's only until you get your JTAC qualification and you start yeah. the train up. So it's not like it's a, oh, well, you're going to be stuck doing this for, for a long time. It's more of a, a rite of passage kind of thing. Yeah, and it, and it was, you know, when I was in Iraq, like I said, um, he told the team that if they didn't take me, uh, he wasn't going to go. So the team made a deal. It was a 30 day deal. They're like, hey, for 30 days, he has to do whatever we decide as training um, and then he can go out with us. So it actually ended up being a blessing because those dudes uh, taught me cruiser weapons, ATVs. Uh, my job normally was taking care of the vehicles, feeding the dogs and making sure that the rover was up, which for me was Awesome. So I got to play with dogs, shoot things, and ride on dirt bikes all the time. So. And how long had you been in the military at this point? Like uh, your first point? About, <laughs> so I went through basic training, schoolhouse. I want to say it was like less than a year before I was in Iraq. Uh, so it was a very like hit pipeline, got to my squadron, did uh, 60 days of combat mission ready training, uh, CMR. And then the flag went up and they're like, hey, you're going to Iraq. And I was like, all right, Man, let's do perfect it. scenario. How could that? That is the I best. Oh, that's possible. amazing! <laughs> Holy <laughs> cow! Yeah. Man, if I could be just a team member a year and a half in, going and getting my first deployment on, holy crap! I'd be hooked. I'd be like, yeah. all right, that's it. I figured it out. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, that awesome. was that was awesome. Came back because of the deployment and 
the things that we did with that team. Um, my Lieutenant Colonel, when I came in, I was still at A1C. He's like, Hey man, uh, you did pretty good. Uh, one of my homies, uh, which a lot of you guys might know, uh, Timothy officer, um, he was my first supervisor. So I walked in, Timmy was like, Hey bro, you're leaving. I was like, uh, I just got back. It's been 10 days. He's like, you're going to JTAC school. I was like, oh, I'm leaving. Sign me up. So, yeah. And I'm out. Yeah. So Timmy was pretty good about that. Sent me to JTAC school, came back. Um, uh, Brandon story was there when I came back. And then when I came back, story was like, uh, you're going to get your eval. I was like, okay, I got back from JTAC UC two days ago, but Sure, let's send it. Got my EVA, and then they kicked me out to airborne school. So it was a pretty fast-paced um, thing for us, which I think we're going back to now with the FTU. Not letting yeah, definitely. Send the squadron. Yeah, those strike FTUs. Man, that's that's awesome. A lot of times we talk, and a lot of the messages that we'll get, people talk about how long the pipeline is and how long training is after that. And we're always like, well, you know, 18 to 24 months, unless you hit it exactly perfectly. Yeah. And you're an example yeah. of exactly perfectly. Yeah. Just back to back to back, getting it done. Yeah. Yeah, that's on un, that's unreal. I mean, you might so obviously no injuries, no setbacks, and and your school schedule was And just hold on, and just straight performance. He also didn't that, fail. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he didn't fail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let's not take that one away from him. Like, welcome to you know, it wasn't all luck. You could just crush him. I'm just trying to keep him humble, man. That's all it is. I yeah. Constantly put him down. And we already talked about the no swimming thing, or he yeah. can't oh, swim. Yeah. So we got that, like, got that out of the way. We should all probably right. bring that up again. So, how bad of a swimmer are you? So, I am a good swimmer. Let me get this out. I can swim. I can go underwater. The whole thing was when somebody told me that I had to do it fast, I was like, What's the deal, bro? I'm from Puerto Rico. I'm like, we swim. It's supposed to be chill. Why do I have to go for that? So I did my swim one time and I finished it. Um, completely ignored the instructor that was yelling at me to go faster because it was a time. I was like, nah, man, I'm in the pool. Like, I'm just going to swim. So I can swim. Don't make me swim fast. Underwater, I, I, I can probably keep up with like most dudes, like the two, three dudes do pool stuff and underwaters and stuff like that. I can keep up, but. Bro, like, why swim fast? I, I don't remember anybody swimming that fast ever. <laughs> so, I'll leave that to you guys. Right. PJs and CCTs. I, well, I don't worry, man. I'm not very fast either. But <laughs> yeah, I, I guess fast much. enough. <laughs> how, much, how much swimming did you do in the pipeline? Like, as part of the, the structure of the pipeline? Yeah, so um, I went through the pipeline when I was, when it was still at Herbert Field. Um, I would argue there were still a lot of like, I'm not going to say jaded instructors, but instructors that probably wanted to go CCT and then went tech B just kidding. They're going to find me and kill me. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, we did, we did quite a, quite a lot of pool PT. Um, obviously being at Herbert field, uh, I would argue three times a week we were hitting the sound side, um, uh, doing a lot of work on the beach. So they made a swim, but one thing common at that point in the school is we were all very so slow swimmers. So it sucked, but it was fun for me because I was just like, oh, okay, everybody's swimming slow. So I'm faster than most of these dudes. So it wasn't bad, but we definitely do it a lot. Now, obviously um, when somebody's doing it right, we kind of follow suit. So uh, obviously all of you guys have been doing your um, water training. So now they added it to our part of the past this. So now we have to do the 500 meter swim. Um, and the underwater, we just, we're not timed like the other career fields are. So nice. Well, Hey, you got in where you could, you got in where you fit in and you slid right underneath that 500 requirement. So good on you. <laughs> they're, they're making me do it next week. We did it last week. So I'm like, <laughs> Oh, get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I think that's a good point because you know, a lot of people, um, that are listening may think that, Hey, you, you knock out the, the past test, you knock out the pipeline. And guess what? I'm never swimming again, or I'm never doing that. But you have, we have, uh, you know, annual and 18 month requirements that we have to do. Yeah. And I think, like I said, you guys have been doing it right. I think uh, PJ, uh, SR, CCT, uh, you guys have been doing it right. It was a thing that we needed to do. Uh, So here at Duke, for example, the guys that I'm with, uh, right off the bat, we knew that we needed to keep up. So we're swimming, we're training, we're hitting the pool. Um, and we're able to pass and pass this. I think uh, I hate the same when people say you rise to the occasion. I think you fall back to your training. So if you don't train to swim, 
you're not going to magically swim 500 meters because you hit the pool and somebody yelled at you Definitely. about it. So we're Absolutely. hitting it. On that same uh, topic, you know, everyone always talks about swimming for PJs and stuff, but um, the rucking for TAC P, because you guys are out with the army, you guys are going on like those long ruck march and stuff like that. So, a guy that's coming in and wants to be specifically, you know, TAC P, what would you say is a goal for rucking that you recommend, you know, that they try to train up to in the meantime while they're thinking about it and training up for it? So, I'll be honest with you, any dude that's trying to get, go TAC P, um, a ruck should be literally like water you like i ruck three times a week um not with a like two times a week not with a lot of weight i hit the track here at herbie because uh, i have that soft material um uh, but i'll lock out i'll log out easily uh i do four six and then my long ones on the weekends are 10 uh, but it let it not be mistaken if you are going to be you're probably going to ruck more than anybody you know because that's the army likes to walk the primary method of transportation when you talk to any army commander is <laughs> two feet. Uh, so if you, if you want to be type P, I would recommend that a ruck at 35 pounds should be the minimum. And that's like your warm up weight. So ruck a lot. Perfect. And we definitely got to get you on for another episode so we can talk like just specific rucks i know there's a lot of stuff and build up to it because guys throw on a pack and they're like i'm just gonna go 90 pounds for three miles in their first ruck and then they end up breaking themselves because they haven't been working up to it so don't go out there and do anything ridiculous guys but just know if you're going for tac p we're gonna be putting out another ruck episode so you guys can train safely and train up to that standard with the time that you guys have so yeah i just want to throw that out there for sure. <laughs> oh, the old ruck. We've gotten a lot of um, got a lot of questions about that actually. And I just went for a ruck two days ago and, and posted about it, and uh, and I got again. It was a recovery ruck for me, you know. And um, everybody's like, "What? What is a recovery ruck? Like how how what how is that a thing? It's a you thing. Know? And it's like, it's well, it's, yeah, it's totally a thing. That's a, that's absolutely <laughs> a thing." So, Not only that, like, like you, like you guys me. mentioned, you got to look at the right ruck, got to look at the right equipment. Um, I'm sure you guys will talk about it in the ruck video, but I still rock an Alice frame. I have a new Alice frame, uh, the newer ones that they put out, but oh, good man. Old trustworthy never fails. Roomba, you came to the right spot. Boy, do we have some <laughs> gear. We have a gear recommendation for you. Listen, I was using that same Alice frame. Like, I'm not going to I'm not gonna jump into a commercial right now, but, man. Yeah. <laughs> but I will. <laughs> Everly stock. Man, that, that mainframe that they got. Oh, golly. It changed your life, homie. I'll have to try it out. Do it, man. We'll hook it up. Um, I, I, I have kind of, in, in previous episodes, talked a little bit, and I've only hit a little bit on what – cct as a jtac does downrange but what would what would you consider to be the the primary mention set of a conventional tac p um once they deploy as a jtac yeah so uh two environments right now uh you obviously have the guys outside the wire and you guys gotta have the guys at the talk at the headquarters um so primarily uh we live by one thing it's advisor system control uh, if you go to the schoolhouse, you're going to hear that multiple times. You're going to hear that multiple times throughout your career. Advise, assist, and control. Uh, so the, the advising, um, we're firepower integration experts. So uh, we advise ground commanders, whoever the component commander is, whoever we're working with, on um, the best employment of fire support. When I say fire support, that includes Air Force firepower, Marines, Naval, Army. Uh, we're the guys that know a little bit about everything and we know how to use it the right way. Uh, so then integrating, uh, we we're the guys that kind of look at, we can look at the battlefield, uh, both from a talk setup or even outside the wire with your team, whoever you're working with your platoon, and you can assess at what time is the right time to bring the right effects to bear. Uh, but you're integrating all in a way that it doesn't limit one thing. Uh, for example, if you need to shoot your artillery pieces that the army needs to, fire while you're also conducting uh airstrikes using your air assets that we know how to do it we integrate it um and the last thing that i would argue we do is that control piece uh, control in the sense of you know calling in airstrikes calling artillery naval gunfire whatever it may be but we tend um what we teach these at the schoolhouse and after that is like you control as a jtac in general the tempo of the battlefield so you decide like hey does this make sense 
Um, a lot of people are going to be going crazy and everybody's going to be yelling at you like just drop bombs. And normally that's not the first answer that you want to assess. Uh, so we can control the tempo of the battlefield by just being the calm, collected guy, assessing the battlefield and making the right decision. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I always, I try and equate it to, hey, you know, your conventional attackees are amazing at large military combat operations. I mean, when it, if you were to put me in that kind of situation where I've got large maneuver elements and tanks and that kind of stuff, and I'm trying to bring fire support to the battlefield, man, I'll be able to do it just because of the training I've had, the, the pretty specific training I have had thanks to attack peas. I could do it. Um, but I would, I would get my butt handed to me severely. Um, whereas what I have noticed just, you know, being at the weapons school was a lot of our combat controllers or our, our uh, soft tack peas would perform very well in a counterinsurgency type mission set. But our conventional guys would definitely have to step their game up and learn, much like I had to learn the large military combat operations. You guys would have to learn how to operate in a coin environment because it's it's very quick, very dynamic, and it's almost like a sprint um, from you know the moment you hit the ground or, or you know a little bit before while you're on the helicopter till until you're off. Yeah. Um, how, how do you think about that? Am I, am I accurate in that? Setting, no, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I think the biggest thing too is the size of the people that we support, which you kind of highlighted. Um, Wait a second, you sec- support giants? Oh, you're talking. <laughs> oh, oh, you're talking you about. Just not- take that personally. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not talking about the size of the individual people. You're talking about the size yeah. of the elements. Oh, okay, sorry to interrupt. Go on. Yeah, no, I know better. If I talk about size, uh, PJ <laughs> will find me. So. Uh, but no, um, so you know, the average JTAC, your senior airman JTAC, your A1C JTAC first deployment, he's going to be with 60 people. He is a JTAC for 60 people. So when you're talking about 60 people moving in four different maneuver elements, um, and that's your first rotation, uh, it's just a lot of people to keep track of. Or like special forces, they have like smaller teams, specialized, uh, they go through a lot of training. Um, you have Private Snuffy who made it out of basic training, went to his schoolhouse, he's an infantryman. Boom, he's deployed. Uh, so uh, big si- uh, big uh, maneuver elements. Additionally, uh, like you mentioned, Peach's armor. Uh, I am one of the guys that hit armor first. So I went with the armor unit initially. And then uh, from armor, I've gone infantry, cavalry, and done it all. But like you mentioned, the rate of speed that we move, um, an armor unit moves very fast. Infantry moves slow. Uh, air assault and airboy just all depends but you're always going to end up minimum with 60 dudes in the battlefield and that's always minimum that's a company level jtac 60 dudes in the battlefield minus attachments so a lot of people to track uh, a lot of fire support to track so um, tends to be a little bit harder in that sense um, but it makes us smart at like big war like we're we're really good when the big war kicks off um, and this little small conflicts, I think you need more of a specialized force, uh, which the soft JTACs kind of come into play. No, I agree. And you, you kind of introduced it uh, before I could even bring it up, but the different, different elements that you support in terms of armor, mechanized, um, airborne, and, and infantry. Um, and w- which ones have you kind of had more experience with? So uh, I've actually hit all of them. I've worked with... Uh, Mechanized armor, uh, that was my initial bread and butter uh, when I first came in. Um, then I moved to infantry and cavalry, uh, worked with scouts. I deployed with uh, airborne dudes, uh, which people say deploy with airborne dudes, but they ain't no dude jumping in combat right now. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only dudes that are jumping are not big army. Tell you that much right now. But how they're the, airborne. How dare you? You heard how it here first. You. <laughs> <laughs> they're airborne. They're airborne in combat. You're in, Never opening a parachute with those dudes, but I worked with some dudes uh, from Italy, uh, airborne, um, and then I've also done air assault. So I've kind of worked with all of them. I'd argue I had to call my bread and butter. I'm definitely an armor armor expert. I think that's a very complicated way of fighting war based on the rate of speed that those dudes fight. So I still remember the ranges of all their guns, which I'd need to dump that out of my head at some point. So <laughs> there's only so many penguins on the iceberg. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, a crazy thing that I don't even think I fully realize. Like, we got JTACs out there moving with armored, you know, armored divisions. God, that's got to be dynamic as crap. 
It gets confusing, dude. Uh, Abrams. Max effective range is 4K. So if you're talking to an army uh, army commander with uh, armor, the first thing he's going to tell you: if you shoot anything inside 4K, he's going to punch you in the throat. Uh, so to them, <laughs> 4K is your moving target. So as a JTAC, if you're moving with an armor or mechanized unit that normally has some sort of armor attached to them, um, you're shooting from 4K to 7K, and they're traveling at 30, 30 to 40 miles an hour. So four to seven K goes by really fast. So you're talking about trying to put a bomb somewhere quick. So that way your tanks are not getting fragged or anything. Um, that's a rush. And it dude, that is off. absolutely ridiculous. I can't even figure out time zones on when to get on like the podcast. And you're talking about, <laughs> you're talking about literally doing rolling math to kill somebody four to seven K away. That, that's well, like, that, that's like the world's most badass middle school problem. You're in an armored vehicle. You're going 30 miles an hour. <laughs> Where she <laughs> dropped his bomb. Another another armored vehicle is driving at you at five thousand. <laughs> you want to kill that thing? <laughs> yeah, that's all right. You're not the only one with time zones issues. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> Ru- 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 Ruba yesterday <laughs> was like, "Hey, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, eight o'clock Central works for, me, or uh, yeah, eight o'clock works for me." And I'm like, "Okay, well, you're in Central time. Yep, yep, I'm in Central time." Oh wait a minute! I'm not in Savannah anymore. Uh, yeah, 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 that'll work, dude. I yeah, like literally. I was setting my watch at like, oh yeah, nine o'clock EST Savannah time. And then I was like, wait a minute, no, wait, I'm not that, in yeah. Savannah right now, dude. I did like that's the running joke with us is every single time. Like I literally have to like write it down and be like, okay, you're on Pacific Standard Time. Everybody else is on the East Coast. You need to figure this out. <laughs> Yeah, it was, Every like, freaking it was time. embarrassing how we text each other that to be like, oh, no, man, by the way, 8 o'clock works great. Oh, man, it's the worst. That's the worst. Lots of, lots of fingers involved with that, man. Yeah. <laughs> A couple toes, whatever. <laughs> yeah, take my boots off. <laughs> nice. Roomba, what, um, what advanced schools have you gotten the opportunity to attend? Yeah, so I've been, uh, obviously... Uh, you were my instructor, so I'll start with that one. Uh, Weapons School. So Weapons School, obviously, went there for six months. I've been through Airborne School, went to Survival, went to Arctic Survival. That was a horrible thing in my life. Never want to do that again. Um, I'm with you right there. Uh, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> Arctic um, Survival is the – man, I went there as like a regular dude, and I was I made the mistake of being motivated. Worst time ever. Hashtag. I'm a fair weather JTAC, dude. Fair weather JTAC. Like, <laughs> the weather's not good. Don't send me. <laughs> um, but been there. Uh, got to go through, obviously, a lot of shooting school, uh, schools. Went through LURS uh, before. Um, now they kind of got together, and it's Arslic. Uh, it used to be uh, Arslic and then LURS, so that way you could learn uh, long-range reconnaissance. So went through that. Um, and then... Oh, yeah. And I went to like a calf school for like scouts with the army because I have a lot of those cool schools when you're with them. So that's kind of cool. Nice. Good. Well, are there uh, any of those that are required like for your graduate? I know you had a, t- a short timeline, but for those guys that are like interested in TACP, um, does everyone get airborne or just whenever you're attached to one of those units kind of thing? And that's kind of how you figure out what advanced schools you're going to end up getting. Yeah. So, uh, Good question because there's a lot of rumor mail about that, so I'll smash it. Uh, so for attack fees, unlike the other three bird charges that are uh, that you guys are talking about, so CCT, SR, uh, and PJ, we are not jump inherent. So the difference between jump inherent and jump qualified for us is jump inherent career fields have to go to everyone's school. Jump qualified career fields have the opportunity. Our career field right now is in a weird change um, where they're qualifying everybody. So um, the opportunity for a dude to go to airborne school, 90% that the dude's going to go. Um, even uh, at Savannah, where I was before I came over uh, over to Asoc, over at Duke, um, we were getting airborne slots like nonstop because our career was trying to, like I said, when dudes do it right, we follow. So you guys have been doing it right for a while. So now we're just kind of trying to follow suit. Uh, so we're starting to qualify a lot of guys uh, through airborne school. Um, the opportunity to be there, if a dude wants to go to airborne school, at the schoolhouse, there's also opportunities to get picked up for airborne units. I was supposed to go to an airborne unit. I had orders to Alaska. Um, like I said, Woof. I'm a beach boy from Puerto Rico, so I was like, <laughs> not today, no, ISIS. So I switched uh, <laughs> orders with a dude to Fort Hood. Somebody was like, Fort Hood's going to suck. Uh, but 
I had multiple rotations out of Fort Hood uh, because of the dudes that were there. Uh, like I mentioned, like my boy Timmy officer, I don't, he never let me uh, stay home. He's like, oh, you're a dwell, Tom. You still have 30 days uh, of dwell. No, uh, sign this piece of paper, please. You're deploying again. So, uh, <laughs> get it. so he, took, he took care of me. Uh, but yeah, airborne schools, easy to get. Air assault, super easy to get. Those, I would argue those two schools are the easiest ones to get in our career field. Um, and then the rest of the schools are going to be based on your location where you're stationed at. So if you're stationed with a unit that has like a Pathfinder school nearby, super easy to get. Um, dudes that are near those bases literally just walk on. Um, but Pathfinder range in all schools, they're not hard to get at all. If you want to get them, um, if you want to get them, you're going to have the opportunity to go. I'm going to some schools here, uh, after I complete my training, uh, going to be a big boy and start jumping out of higher altitudes with you guys. So yeah. looking forward to that. Yeah. Now we're talking. Uh, and then uh, I made a dumb decision and I decided I want to go to Rangers. So uh, I'll be <laughs> doing that. Okay. Cool, so when man. is that so that we, maybe we don't release this podcast or maybe we hook you up. And we we do, and maybe we we'll, we'll tag the Ranger Bat guys in this, and you know oh, really man. hook you up. Hey man, half of my buddies that I deploy with uh, with group or something are actually instructors out there, and they're oh. the ones encouraging me to go. So they're already waiting for me. So oh, that's uh, the worst. You know, oh, that's the worst. It's like the best worst thing. I know. Yeah. So my my whole thing is like, hey, if uh, if I manage to make it with you guys beating me down, then I guess I really earned that thing. So, but. Yeah, definitely trying to go out there um, sometime in the summer because, like I said, fair weather, dude. 110 degrees, all about that weather. <laughs> Anything beneath 72, <laughs> I need my uh, 72. great poofy jacket. 72? 72, 72, yeah. uh, 72 degrees, I'm it's out. A very specific number. I don't know where you got 72 from. Specific <laughs> number. Dead serious. 72. <laughs> First dude in oh. Afghanistan that pulled out his uh, great poofy jacket. Every time, yeah. <laughs> got him. That's funny too. When did you go through uh, Weapon School in Vegas? I can't remember the, the time Alpha. of year. Yeah. Okay. So that was the winter class. So yeah, you were pretty cold then because that, that elevation up there in the mountains. It's I'm good that we highlight. ran you around a lot. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Highlight that some CZT instructors. I'm not gonna throw any names. Uh, you know, outside of Peaches and other dudes. Um, <laughs> definitely like to run. And the moment that some people find out that good old Roomba doesn't like to be in the cold, <laughs> Roomba got all the running missions and all the oh. missions at the top of the mountain. Like, hey, where are we going today? Oh, the guys are gonna be in the vehicle downstairs. No, you're going to the top of the mountain. I said, oh. Okay. <laughs> well, we don't want to. Yeah. You don't want you to be cold. I mean. <laughs> Doing it that, for you. That would be a yeah. check, check, and a Roger, which in military <laughs> terms usually means f off. That's right next to noted, <laughs> which has also been used recently. <laughs> right. <laughs> um. So, Roomba, what would you like as a uh, when you're home station? What would a normal normal day or a normal week look like for you? Yeah. So, um, I'll use Savannah and then Duke. Uh, right. Different. Uh, different tempos. So. Savannah, where I was there, uh, with the army on average, uh, you're obviously going to PT a ton in the mornings. Uh, we have the physical therapist right now, the, uh, the sports team, they take care of all your PT. So talking about 79, you're probably going to be in doing PT after that. Uh, we're obviously mirrored a lot of your stuff. So now we're broken down into teams. Uh, so after that, you're going to check in with your team, see what's going on. Um, I'd argue like minimum three days out of the week, you're going to be doing some sort of training out in the ranges, MOA, whatever you're going to be doing, controlling. We have our own simulators just like CCTs do. Uh, so you're going to be controlling on the sim, trying to hone those JTAC skills um, a lot earlier than before. Uh, like I mentioned before, you, I, I went through pipeline and everything happened to fall into place, but dudes had to wait a little bit longer to go to JTAC school. Uh, now they're trying to qualify dudes within 18 months, huh? which is pretty quick. Uh, so you're getting a lot of A1C JTAX um, in the career field. So you'll do that. Uh, one day, one of the days out of the weeks, you'll be under the weapons and tactics uh, mentoring. So those dudes will do some advanced training, academics. Uh, you're going to get some Intel briefs. Uh, we're always doing Intel briefs uh, weekly. And then on Fridays, you know, for those who work hard, we party hard. So at the end of the week, you're going to get some sweet briefs and then uh, you're going to go hang out in the heritage room 
Chicago no, Talk. Heritage for perfect. It's it absolutely. It is one hundred percent not a bar. We don't have those. No, <laughs> we have heritage rooms. Tell us, Keywords. the army guys that went to our unit, they think otherwise. <laughs> but heritage room, they're like, dude, what is this? Welcome to our heritage room. There's all the heritage. <laughs> so, so for everybody who's listening, the the backdrop behind that is the Air Force is not allowed to have bars at their units. You know, as in bars, drinking bars, right? So, um, because that would be promoting drinking and a frat boy type mentality, if you will, whatever. So, no, um, that would be bad. That would yeah. be terrible. I would never work yeah. for an organization. Yeah. No, I wouldn't. I was you hoping you'd I, continue that, Aaron. Well, I, I would never, <laughs> I would never work for an organization that puts such a high focus on drinking, especially binge drinking. And especially after work, I would never do that. What I would prefer is an organization that has a proud history of all the people that came before us in the same room as maybe a couple kegs. That's all I'm saying. With some, you know, now I, now I almost self incriminated there. No, nope. <laughs> <laughs> caught myself. Please. All right, tread lightly. Tread lightly. Go too far. Back to you. Quick question: So we're <laughs> not in a frat. Uh, no, no, not the frat. Got it, got it. Not however, the frat. however, I, 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 I use that phrase specifically because I remember in a brief with a two star that was briefing us and he was like, you know, you guys in this frat boy mentality. And I'm like, what? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, what we literally here, right? like, what does that mean? Somebody you know? in the background is like, Jimmy, put the beer down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Okay. Roma, you've you've provided quite a a comprehensive uh, you know details about TACP and what they do on a conventional side. Um, so, still you know treading lightly with with talking about stuff. What would you as a, as a soft TACP going in? What are the kind of differences or, or changes in that mindset and that mission set? Yeah, so I'll speak uh, for my myself and my boys at, at Duke. Um, so the tempo is a little bit different. Uh, like I mentioned, now we're working with a special, with specialized units, uh, that have a more smaller focus, uh, if that makes sense. So we're focused on our, our individual capabilities. Uh, the tempo of our training is a lot more. Uh, so, um, our numbers are smaller, like in the team that I'm in, there's only eight of us right now. So, um, eight dudes. I'm the weapons officer, so we can definitely focus on um, our JTAC stuff. And then we're obviously on uh, Herbie, which we can do a lot of training here based on the, the things that are here. So and the soft side, um, you know, talking for the dudes at the 17th or like the two SC, uh, the two series SCSs uh, for my bros, if I can. Um, those dudes are working with more specialized units, you know, their, their focus is on their specific mission sets. And there's a lot of resources and time spent to make sure that those dudes, um, at the top of their game, uh, I will always highlight that one thing that I learned from a CCT, uh, uh, when I was at weapon school was that a lot of dudes look at the differences in like, you know, our methods of transportation, which it's honestly all it is like conventional moves a certain way, soft moves a certain way. But at the end of the day, a CCT JTAG and a TACP JTAG go after the same thing. We're trying to hone our skills. We're trying to make ourselves uh, better JTAGs by being able to do things faster. So um, that's what I would argue on the soft side. We're kind of focused on because we don't have such a big customer to worry about. We're just more focused on our, honing our skills. Okay. Hey, that brings me to a good point. Have Have any of you other dudes ever worked with any uh, conventional or soft, soft tech piece? Yeah, I, so I got them on my troop right now, Peaches. Yeah, oh. yeah, we're uh, all mixed teams up at uh, at the STS I work at. So, man, I, those dudes are out there getting after it. I got guys going to cold weather. I pulled a couple guys off one trip to go get some live cast going on. So, um, we we use those those dudes a lot. And I got you know speaking for the guys that you know work on my troop, man, those guys get after it. It's been good. Yeah, yeah. My first rotation, we had. Uh, Soft tack P out there with us on a combat controller because we're out there with two teams. And then uh, at the two, three, yeah, we're all mixed up. So, um, fair bit of experience. And, you know, it's, it, when it comes down to J tacking, um, I couldn't really tell the difference uh, on the soft side. You know, they, they're, they're both doing exactly what they're needed to do. 
and uh, the, the combat controllers just had a, some other stuff that they worried about uh, that they'd that get after, but it was all good. Yeah, I've, I've done some train-ups with them um, prior to deployments. It was just um, as they were trying to integrate them into our teams, like you said, they are now, like uh, Aaron was just saying. But um, I want to also ask one of the questions about transitioning from uh, conventional to soft TACP. Was there an extra selection process in there for guys that are trying to, like, if they're thinking, like, I'm going to go conventional and then soft, like, what do I, some of the steps that, to get there? Yeah, so uh, right now, there's two different selections. Uh, Peach is you're tracking some of the movements for some units going to other units. Uh, so yeah. I think ultimately there's going to be. We're not trying. Selections. We're not trying to cover that one. Yeah. So <laughs> there's going to be there's two selections right now. At some point, uh, there may be three, uh, but you definitely go through a separate selection and assessment uh, to get picked up into AFSOC. Uh, nothing to deter dudes from. Uh, you know, I went through selection, and when I went through selection. Um, I was a weapons officer, which I really appreciated because I was ran through the same thing that all the other conventional attack PEs or dudes that had soft experience went through. Um, we all went through the same selection for the unit that I am in. Um, so they treated us all the same. Um, you can just expect, like like I said, if 35 pounds was a minimum with a ruck, then you better bump that thing up. So minimum standards, uh, uh, I see your all's uh, podcast and the amount of uh times that you guys highlight that like the minimum should not be what you should be aiming for uh so i think you guys hit it on the now if you're going to go to selection you got to train harder you got to try to be honestly the way i mentally kind of think about it is i got to treat it try to beat the guy that i was yesterday so if i'm trying to beat the guy that i was yesterday i'm always going to be a little bit better i'm not going to be you know worlds apart from yesterday but i definitely try to run a little bit faster or do more push-ups um because that's what you need a selection no, that's good. That's uh, you're always in a competition, whether it's with yourself or with somebody else on the team. Facts. <laughs> yep. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, I know the the intent of this podcast, or this at least episode, was to provide everybody with a background on seat on uh, TACP, just because we we get constant questions about it, and and believe it or not that. <laughs> The two career fields that everybody's been been begging us to talk about are, are SR and TACP. SR is so <laughs> hot right now. Oh, oh my goodness. It's so the hot. hottest. <laughs> the hottest. Got some hot fire coming off that special reconnaissance. He just needs to work on his blue steel. I don't <laughs> That's uh the, yeah, your blue steel is actually part of your selection for SR. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love how like SR doesn't need to do anything. You just sit there and you look really good and people are like, Oh my God, what is going on? Meanwhile, you're sitting there just like, I, I'll let you know in a second. <laughs> it, it's classified. So don't ask. Hashtag <laughs> gas mask. <laughs> Redacted. <laughs> right. So That's I do awesome. want to transition a little bit just because at least we're talking about TACP and kind of what the difference is between TACP and CCT. So, I, Rumba, you've done a fantastic job of covering what a TACP is, and I'm sure we'll still get a couple of questions that we could um, dive in on later and, and probably have you on another another episode to go into those additional questions And because maybe we didn't you know, pick the scab or, or dig deep enough in some of these. Um, but transitioning a little bit just to, in your opinion what would be some of the primary differences between a TACP and a cct at least from the conventional side yeah so again uh like trent mentioned um tag P's, we're very focused on like fires integration jtac is like our bread and butter um we train to shoot move communicate but that's a method to ultimately always get to jtac right uh cct's same as in shoot, move, communicate, JTAC plus survey plus land aircraft plus, you know, make sure everything's set up for a jump. So um, I would argue TACPs have our mission set. Uh, we JTAC. Our main thing is we have multiple echelons or different types of units that we have to support where a CCT is a JTAC to your team. He also has to consider his methods of transportation, but that's not his only job. Um, you know, so for you guys, you guys have your survey stuff, your airfield stuff, landing aircraft, um, 
which is a huge eye opener when we go to weapons school. Uh, for attack to even get close to doing some of that stuff, you have to get DCO certified. Uh, so you have to get like work with an air mobility officer and get all this additional training where a CCT that's, you know, your air traffic control school that everything that you guys learned through all that, um, makes you guys an expert. Like you're pretty much an air traffic control tower with two radios, which is kind of scary, but pretty awesome at the same time. So, um, <laughs> if you think about it from that perspective, like the CCT is going to be able to do that. So he's going to be able to like, you know, jump ahead of the team, set up an airfield, land, you know, land aircraft on that airfield while still doing his JTAC job. Uh, for us on the conventional side, um, we are moving with the maneuver force and we are jtac with that maneuver force the entire time. Uh, we're not really separating ourselves from that maneuver force where a CCT JTAC needs to be able to work with the team and then do it by himself uh, with his brooch agent. So, yeah. No, I think that's a, I think that covers it pretty well. Um, I don't know. Would you guys add anything else to that specifically? I was sitting here going like, man, what else should I add to that? But that's a pretty good synopsis. You guys no, look good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, that, that's like the walk off mic drop of, of the differences between the two of them. I just want to put out there, like, especially the way that we're moving all of those missions, uh, you know, global access strike and recovery. JTACs are a part of all three. PJs are a part of all three. CCT is part of all three. SR is part of all three. Like we work in those small teams to make those missions happen. So those global access, those surveys, those controlling of the airfield, those forcible entry procedures, every, you know, we're, we're all working together at this point. That's been a great thing that, you know, TACP moved over, you know, under the special warfare banner. And, you know, you guys are definitely following along faster. Like, man, that's awesome. Cause you know, you, you guys are a force multiplier, um, you know, the same as CCT is just in different sort of flavors. And once you start figuring out how to use those, uh, career fields correctly, man, you can, you can be a pretty lethal force and TACP is a big part of that. Agreed. Like yeah. I said, you guys have been doing it good. We're just following. <laughs> yeah, I think um, one of the things that if you want to clear up, just because I know this is probably going to be a question from dudes. Um, so you're saying that, you know, CCTs and TACPs are stationed together, um, you know, doing the same kind of missions that's working together. They're, they're going to ask, you know, why would they take a CCT versus a TACP on a mission? And I know like some of the LZ stuff and that survey stuff, but if it's stri for straight JTAC stuff, what do you guys, what do you guys think right there? Why would they pick one versus the other? I'm going to throw you guys both in the hot seat since I wanted to hear something from Peach too. <laughs> you Send take it peaches. first room, but okay. All right. I'll, I'll take it first. Uh, I like, I like <laughs> that was the, the opposite of a Mexican standoff. They're like, no, you go, no, you go. <laughs> okay. So, um, you gotta you gotta ask for a capability. So when people, a lot of times, what happens is people ask, "Hey, I need a JTAC." So we have to, as as somebody who you know determines whether there is actually a need or a requirement for it. It's like, okay, what what do you guys actually need? Well, we need a JTAC. Okay, well, a JTAC is a qualification. What's the location? What do you anticipate this this person, this JTAC, doing? Um, and if it turns out that it is strictly for fire support, then and, and there's no other chance of airfields. And it also depends on you know who they're supporting too. If it's if it's going to be big army, then okay, then we kind of know that it's going to be fire support and stuff like that. Um, that's not a guarantee. But um, if there's going to be airfield or airdrops or it's a soft team, then we may lean towards a CCT or a soft tech P. Um, but if there's airfields at all, it, it's going to be a CCT. Additionally, like I'll, I'll use an example. Um, I was deployed. Um, it was me and a CCT uh, JTAC on the same FOB. So there's a conventional force, which is very common. On uh, There's a conventional force and a soft force. Same FOB. Um, literally like our talk, we shared the talk. So we talked to each other all the time. Um, I was a senior airman. He was a senior airman. Um, so there were some that like, based on the mission, they're like, Hey man, um, we're going to have seven maneuver elements out there. The soft dudes are going to be doing their thing. The conventional dudes are going to be providing support for the soft dudes. Where do you think we need to go? Uh, where do you, where do you want to put you guys? And I remember like me and the CCT dude would look at each other and we'd kind of laugh because both of us are like senior airmen. We're both like, bro, let's go outside the wire and shoot everything. <laughs> um, so, but it took, it took like a lot of maturity at that point to go like, Hey man, um, 
your team's going to be uh, the lead element. That convention of forces just providing support to your fighting. So where I'm going to be best employed is back at the talk. I'll run your stack. I'll make sure that you have fire support assets like ready on queue. Um, and I'll protect kind of your outer boundary. And then you handle everything in the target area. And we got so good at that, that I would argue there were a lot of firefights and most people would have been like, uh, how are they going to skin this cat? Uh, but me and this cat like had that down pack, like we knew what to do. Um, and then it ultimately evolved into like, there were a few missions that my army commander was like, no, soft dudes are going to be moving forward here, but we're going to be moving forward here. Um, and we had such a good relationship by that point that we were both outside the wire. Somebody else was running our stack, but the seamless transition of assets between the two of us, uh, nobody really noticed. Like they never knew it was me controlling or the other guy controlling. Um, Cause when it comes to JTAC and like we're both the same, it's just like Pete just said, what additional effects you need on the back, uh, back side of it. And soft tack P's and CCTs, um, we give a lot of sh- uh, shit to each other. However, I would argue you really can't tell uh, the difference if you're at a squadron, like who's JTAGing because they're just JTAG. And then yeah. at a I mean, I'll, squadron, we JTAG. I'll, I'll tell you that from, I mean, from experience right now, like when those two guys are getting on the mic doing like skills, you cannot tell those dudes train to the same standard. It's awesome. And Peach has hit it right on the head. It's just, what effects do you need? Is this a recovery mission? Are we out there doing some sort of long range, you know, surveillance? Are we doing no kidding, you know, bombs on target and stuff like that? Like it's just different ways to get that capability out there. Well, I mean, you, you look at the conventional side, it's, it's using a hammer to get stuff done versus on the soft side, it's more of a scalpel, right? And it's, it's they're similar skill sets, but they're also completely different on how you employ uh, the air power to, to accomplish that mission. So um, they're, they're basically the same thing. And, and I would also say, like, you, when I went through survey school, which is not part of my core skill set, there were, there were TAC P's in the class, right? So we had uh, nerds like me, we had TAC P's, we had controllers, we had everybody in that class. So um, there, there's nothing saying you can't expand your skill set to, to cover down on all the mission sets that are out there. And uh, TAC P's, even on the conventional side that I've seen, uh, you start talking to some of the bros, it's not like they get stuck where they're at. If, if someone needs a JTAC and you're overseas, and it's a soft team, and you're not a soft tech P, um, those guys get pulled all the time uh, to do that stuff. So you always have to be ready. And, uh, and, and I think the best thing about your story was is, you know, you, you, you showed a lot of maturity as, as let's get the mission done and being mission focused. And that's, that's at the end of the day, that's everything for all of us. And uh, whether you be a tech P, or a combat controller or whatever, um, you know, we, we produce guys that are going to go out there and, and accomplish the mission regardless. So I thought that was pretty awesome. I, I just blacked out. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I don't even know. I just blacked well, out. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well um, I think we pretty much covered it. We at least covered all the questions that I wanted to kind of answer and, and have hit. Um, so unless anybody has anything else, I'm going to wrap it up. No, man. Uh, Remember, you cool with putting out your, putting out your socials. You want to have them go through us. How you want to handle it? Yeah. Uh, you guys can put out my stuff out there. It's JC Roomba on Instagram. It's easy to find. Uh, but again, I want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity. Thank you for having this podcast. Uh, a lot of people, I know a lot of dudes. I'm going to rat them out. Like almost all the JTACs at Duke listen to this. So uh, yeah, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> yeah. But all the information that you guys put out is a huge blessing. I think that you guys are out there trying to teach students how to get it done. So I appreciate you guys having me on. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for coming on. Um, we'll, we'll blast you on social media, but for everyone else that's out there that watching or listening, thanks for tuning in. Um, Roomba is, is, and I'm going to call you out on it. It's kind of a legend in the TACP career field and among the weapons officers. He's, he's well known. He's been by name requested to brief the chief Ma- or um, I'm sorry. I almost said chief. Did you brief chief master Sergeant right too? Uh, yeah. Second guy was <laughs> oh, just a light flex. <laughs> just a light flex from the young And the man. chief of staff. I mean, yeah. <laughs> no big deal. I, and I, General Goldstein, whatever. <laughs> no big deal. I wasn't even no tracking chief right. I didn't realize you, you uh, briefed him as well. Oh, man, that just added right on to it. I didn't even plan that. <laughs> Golly. <laughs> so, yeah, his, 
Roomba is well known in the community, um, not only of TAGP and CCT and Special Warfare, but also the weapons officer community coming out of the weapons school. So, man, um, keep doing what you're doing. You're out there crushing it, and and even guys like me absolutely look up to you, and and it's it's fantastic. So keep doing what you're doing, man. Thanks, bro. All right, and everybody else out there, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate you watching sincerely. Please subscribe. Please leave us a review, comment. We want to engage with you. Um, If you go on the Apple Podcast, subscribe, leave us a review, please. Um, It's awesome. We love hearing the feedback. And if you have questions, go straight to Instagram at One's Ready and ask us a question, and we'll hit you up anytime. Again, we appreciate it, and we'll see you guys on the next episode. Later. 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 See you.